asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Well, there's a lot to talk about. I don't know if we're going to fit this in this hour, but I'm going to try anyway. Are you confused about this Windrush saga? The reason I ask you that is because today I was keeping an eye on the social media, the Twitter account for the programme anyway. Now, I don't spend a lot of time on Twitter. In fact, when I'm not in the programme, I'm not really doing much with Twitter because I don't have any time to be doing much with Twitter. And when I put something on Facebook, it automatically uploads to Twitter, which looks like I'm doing stuff, but in fact I'm not. And many of those Facebook posts are scheduled anyway. So the Windrush saga, are you confused about it? Do you even give a shite like? Well, I'll tell you briefly what's been going on with that. It's an interesting story, I think. People who arrived in the UK from Caribbean countries back in the late 1940s, right up to 1971, I think 48 to 71, they'd be known as and have been known as the Windrush generation. Why the Windrush generation? Well, that was the name of the ship that they arrived on. They landed in Essex back in 1948 when an Irishman called Johnny Carey captained Manchester United to lifting the FA Cup at Wembley. In fact, Johnny Carey was from Cork. There you go. So, so, so as far back as that, these workers came from Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, but other islands in the Caribbean. Why? Well, there was a big shortage of labour here after the Second World War. If you know your basic history, you'll know this to be true. So nearly 500 people arrived, many of them children. That influx, for want of a better word, ended in 1971, Commonwealth citizens who already were in the UK up to 71 were given indefinite leave to remain. So following that, a British passport holder who had been born overseas could only settle in the UK if they had a work permit and if they could prove that a parent or grandparent had been born in the UK. So these arrivals then, they did a lot of manual work, they worked on building sites, they cleaned, they worked in hospitals, many of them became nurses. But the Home Office, obviously a very important pillar of government, didn't keep a record of those who were granted leave to remain, nor did they issue any paperwork confirming that. Not too clever, right? And that made it difficult for the Windrush gang to prove that they are or were in the UK legally. And then it gets curiouser and curiouser, dear Alice, because back in 2010, landing cards, which had belonged to those migrants who came in on the Windrush, well, those landing cards were destroyed by the Home Office. Now, that's very interesting, that, and very important, and we'll come back to it. Now, because these people came from British colonies, they understandably believed that they were British citizens. Why? Because those colonies hadn't achieved independence. They thought, well, we're British citizens. We are now, we're here now, we're working now, so on, so on, so on. But recently, and if you've been following this in the news, recently, some of these people, without any documentation, are being told that they can't continue to work without any evidence of their of their citizenship, nor can they get treatment from the National Health Service. And some of them, it has been hinted to some of them that they might not be allowed to remain in the UK. Why? Why? Well, immigration laws were changed about six years ago, meaning now people have to have documentation to work. They've got to have it to rent a house or an apartment or to get benefits, including... NHS healthcare. So obviously, this generation of people and their offspring are pretty worried about it. It's a big mess. Well, it's a disgrace, really, is what it is. Those folks still alive, as many of them are, and their offspring should be immediately given passports and all legal rights at the speed of light. So who destroyed the landing cards? Now, this is very important information for those 
that generation, the Windrush generation. Who destroyed the landing cards? Well, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn face off every week at Prime Minister's questions. And to be honest with you, I'm none the wiser as to who destroyed the immigration cards after this exchange. Yesterday we learnt that in 2010 the Home Office destroyed landing cards for a generation of Commonwealth citizens and so have told people we can't find you in our system. Did the Prime Minister, the then Home Secretary, sign off that decision? Prime Minister. No, the decision to destroy the landing cards was taken in 2009 under a Labour government. Hey. Could I remind the Prime Minister it was her government that created, in quotes, a really hostile environment for immigrants and her government that introduced the 2014 Immigration Act. Mr Speaker, I think we need some absolute clarity on the question of the destruction of the landing cards. And if she's trying to blame officials, I remind her... I remind her of what she said in 2004 when she said she was sick and tired of government ministers who simply blame other people when things go wrong. Does she stand by that advice? Mr. The right honourable gentleman asked me if the decision to destroy the landing cards, the decision to destroy the landing cards, had been taken in my time as Home Secretary. The decision to destroy the landing cards was taken in 2009, and as I seem to recall, in 2009 it was a Labour Home Secretary who was in position. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker! It was under a Tory government, and she was Home Secretary at that time. And that is what is causing such pain and such stress to a whole generation. Yeah. Are you any the wiser, dear listener, as to who destroyed the landing cards? Because I'm certainly not. I haven't got a Scooby-Doo. But it's ridiculous. Why waste valuable time when you could be talking about far more important issues now holy jesus if you're if you're if you're if you're a member of the windrush generation don't throw things at me don't shout at me of course it's important to you this could be dealt with in 2 minutes everybody who came over on that boat their children and their grandchildren immediate full rights of citizenship passports the whole lot and be done with it may said the government wasn't clamping down on commonwealth citizens particularly those from the Caribbean. I met two gentlemen who came over on the Windrush back in London, back in 2014. They used to play dominoes in a pub in London. Two lovely lads, both of whom were from, I think, Trinidad, if I remember. I used to wind them up about putting raspberry in their Guinness. Yeah. Blokes from Jamaica and Trinidad loved their Guinness, but they ruined it with raspberry. Yeah, I didn't like that very much. But um, yeah, so they, they said they'll create a task force to help applicants demonstrate they are entitled to work in the UK, blah, blah, blah. Callous stuff. But the story is a bit of a distraction, I think, from far more important things. That being said, if May's office, when May was Home Secretary, if her office was responsible for destroying the landing cards, well, May might find herself in a bit of trouble. But then again, May is like Teflon. If, if, if selling arms to Yemen, if her husband benefiting from airstrikes on Syria, which we'll come to a bit later on, is not going to destroy May, I don't think this issue will either. Now, I wrote about this today. Oh, by the way, my great friend and colleague, Jean Ann Crowley, um, who's got a wicked sense of humour, said that when the Windrush arrived in 1948, she said, same years the Irish came over to the UK on the bombs rush. Remember, we did indeed. We did indeed. And a lot of Irish people do remember. No blacks, no dogs, no Irish. I think that was the order, wasn't it? No blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Used to be uncertain. Certain restaurants, certain pub doors and what have you. Yeah, strange old times. Right, let's talk about this then. Labour and anti-Semitism. By the way, Moinga, who's a regular listener to the programme, he's um, pretty certain Theresa May was in charge of the Home Office when the landing cards were destroyed. Faisal says, Richie, I seem to remember that the same happened to Kenyans 
who had British passports as well. I vaguely recollect that, Faisal. We're going back some time now, but I do vaguely recollect that as well. Base Ninja tweets, OK, I'm cynical, but it seems to me that the Windrush generation have been well and truly set up, lied to, and the Tory elites are over the moon that they can get back to where you're from, where you're from. Remember the vans, he says. Um, Base Ninja is referring to the vans that Theresa May sent out in London a couple of years ago asking people or urging people who didn't belong or at least who didn't have legal rights to be in the UK. Well, those vans had messages saying that basically they should leave. Caused a lot of consternation at the time. Let's move on then. I wrote about this today. Two Labour MPs <coughs> or fishwives you might call them fishwives, received standing ovations in Westminster yesterday after speaking about their own experiences of anti-Semitism and the threats they've had to endure over the years. Luciana Berger alleged that she had put up with abuse for 18 years, saying that she received her first piece of hate mail aged 19. I don't believe that, by the way. I'm sorry, I don't believe Luciana Berger was getting hate mail, anti-Semitic hate mail when she was 19. She might have done, but as politicians have a propensity to lie through their teeth, I'm not buying it. Anyway, they told this this debate yesterday that it, the Labour Party had a duty to the next generation to confront anti-Semitism. Denial wasn't an option. Ruth Smees, who's a, a Labour politician from Stoke, said British Jews had a right to participate in public life as equals and we wouldn't be bullied. We know what anti-Semitism is, she says. We know where it leads, so on, so on, so on. We can play a bit of it. This is Luciana Berger and Ruth Smees yesterday. This is hysterical stuff. I think you might like it. Madam Deputy Speaker, we have a duty to the next generation. Denial is not an option. Prevarication is not an option. Being a bystander who turns the other way is not an option. The time for action is now. Enough really is enough. And I just want to conclude with the very eloquent words of the former Chief Rabbi, Dr Jonathan Sachs. And he said, an assault upon Jews is an assault upon difference. And a world that has no room for difference has no room for humanity itself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That was Luciana Berger. And that was so moving, allegedly, that the next speaker, Ruth Smith, broke down in tears. It was so moving about humanity. This is great stuff. So Ruth Smith then is next, and this is epic stuff. This Andrew Percy. There have always been racists and anti-Semites in our country lurking on the fringes of our society both left and right. I dare say there always will be. What is so heartbreaking is the concerted effort in some quarters to downplay the problem. For every comment like those you have just heard, you can find 10 people ready to dismiss it, yeah. to cry smear, yeah. to say that we are weaponising anti-Semitism. Yeah. 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 Weaponising yeah. anti-Semitism. My family came to this country fleeing the pogroms in the 19th century. Of our relatives who stayed in Europe, none survived. We know what anti-Semitism is. We know where it leads. How dare these people suggest that we yeah. would try yeah. something so dangerous, so toxic, so formative to our lives and those of our families. How dare they seek to dismiss something so heinous, to reduce it to the realm of political point scoring. How dare they, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah. I'm not just speaking for me, but for the young Jewish people I meet across the country who are beginning to fear they don't have a place. Young people who are braver and tougher and better than you and than I could ever be. What? Did she just say young people who are bigger and braver and tougher than you and I could ever be? Really? This snowflake generation, this generation of wet noses who can't go to university and study religion lest they get a trigger warning that there's going to be a picture on the, on the overhead projector of a man nailed to a cross. Really? This generation who can't allow somebody come to debate their student unions because they've, or student union even, because they've got different opinions than them. Really? Really? Fuck off with that nonsense. The young generation are better than we'll ever be. The young generation are idiots, most of them. Muppets. Muppets. Who can't, who can't entertain a word of criticism about their ideas 
about their values, about their opinions without melting down and demanding that the person who is disagreeing with them is banned. Give me a break. Give me a break. And there's no evidence in this country that young Jewish men and women who really are English men and women who believe in a fairy godfather in the sky, okay? They're not Jewish by birth. They're white, European by birth. They're Jewish by choice. And I don't know any Jewish men and women or young Jewish men and women who are shitting in their truthers about the, about the advent, about the dawn of this hateful anti-Semitism because it doesn't exist. This is crap by Ruth Smeeth. And Corbyn is sitting there twiddling his thumbs and mumbling under his breath with annoyance instead of standing up, asking her to give way and eviscerating her. Which is what he should do, of course. To be the kind of young people who make you feel that future, that our future is safe in their hands. But right now, they don't feel safe. I've run out of time. <laughs> there is something more fundamental at stake here than any of the parties, than any party's policy platform or electoral performance. The right of Jewish people to participate in the politics of our country as equals. Madam Deputy Speaker, last month we heard a plea: enough is enough. I stand here today to say that we will not be bullied out of political engagement. Yeah. We are going nowhere and we stand yeah. and we keep fighting until the evils of anti-Semitism have been removed from our yeah. side. Order. 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 What a load of monumental bollocks that was. There is no anti-Semitism in this country. The Jewish Institute, the Jewish Policy Research Institute, I've probably gotten the name wrong, did the biggest study ever in the history of this country, not hundreds of people, but tens of thousands of people, and concluded that anti-Semitism is basically non-existent, because it is. Let alone the fact that anti-Semitism is a misnomer anyway, and it doesn't mean hatred of Jews, of course. It's crazy this, isn't it? Absolutely crazy. What was the um, the organisation? I've gotten it wrong. The Jewish Policy Research, that's right, the Institute for Jewish Policy Research conducted one of the biggest studies on this subject ever in this country and concluded there was no evidence that hatred of or even a general dislike of those who identify as Jews was on the rise. It, it ain't on the rise. It's nonsense. But it's very serious nonsense very serious because of the implications of it and for it right so Corbyn was sitting down kept stum didn't say anything it was a day for it today we'll hear from John Mann shortly you'll remember John Mann chasing after Ken Livingston when Livingston spoke about the Haver agreement Mann chairs the old parliamentary group against anti-semitism we'll hear from him in a minute um, so PMQs, then we mentioned PMQs, Prime Minister's Questions. Faisal Islam is Sky's political editor and he had a studio full of MPs to watch Prime Minister's Questions and then provide analysis of what they had heard. Now his panel included Nikki Morgan, Tory MP, former Education Secretary, Labour MP Chris Williamson, who's an ally of Jeremy Corbyn's, and a woman called Emma Little Pengelly from the Democratic Unionist Party. They were the three in the studio. It's like football. They watch Prime Minister's questions and then they analyse it afterwards. So the big issue during Prime Minister's questions was the Windrush story and the migrants. And they spoke about that in the post-PMQ analysis, but Tory party Nikki Morgan MP couldn't wait to get stuck into Chris Williamson of Labour about anti-Semitism. This is good stuff. Have a listen to this. But listening while we're watching PMQs to Chris Williamson chuntering away, lack of sympathy for the anti-Semitism debate yesterday, the two MPs, no, female no, MPs, no, there were some brave, brave female MPs who spoke out yesterday about the abuse they suffered. This week we have seen a Labour Party in disarray in the House of Commons. I have never seen anything like this. Labour backbench MPs standing up 
time after time to condemn their, their leader. No, I'm sorry, I'm going to have this because I think people need to understand the extraordinary scenes that we have seen. The fact that a Conservative Prime Minister has praised not once, not twice, but three times, I think, this morning, really brave Labour MPs. And I'd like to mention my Treasury Select Committee colleague, John Mann, the MP for Bassett Law, too. Those were extraordinary speeches. Nobody stands up and gives a round of applause to an MP like we did to Labour MP for Stoke, uh, Ruth Smith, yesterday. I mean, that was a true democracy speech and Alison McGovern the same in the Syria debate on, on Monday. So well, I'm not going to downplay to Winrush, come back but it, 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 was, it was left to the Prime Minister to kind of offer consolation and comfort to your colleagues. The Labour Party has a proud record of standing up to racism. We get utterly, rid of Ken we Livingston utterly then. Do what Ian Austin said, get rid of Ken Livingston. I would urge Nikki and others who are, who are trying to make political capital out of this is no. to say, look, Let's work together, because if we look to the Conservative record, and we shouldn't get into this punch and Judy thing, but the Conservative Party has official links with openly anti-Semitic political parties in the European Union. The Hungarian uh, Sorry, Prime Minister, total, for example. No, no, no. If we, if we are, no, it's not Sorry, chat. If we are serious about tackling anti-Semitism, we serious. need to do away that, that together, and we need a cross-party consensus. We need to recognise, as I think some people speaking in the House acknowledged, that, you know, anti-Semitism afflicts the Conservative Party. Right. He went on to talk about how, conser how the Conservative Party has close ties to other right-wing parties in Europe where anti-Semitic things had been said. Fair enough, right? Tit for tat, punch and Judy, blah, blah, blah. So then Chris Williamson says, among other things, that a lot of the online abuse seemingly aimed at the UK's Jewish community is in fact coming from trolls disguised as Labour Party members. Why? Well, to attack the credibility of the party. That's what he says. A lot of this stuff is by people looking to make a problem that isn't there. Abuse online is appalling yes. and we should always call it out. That's very different from suggesting, however, that the individuals responsible for that are themselves Labour Party members. And I have seen Sorry, these are evidence. Far left, I have seen evidence. Hold on a minute. I've people seen, like Luciana I have seen a right, Just a minute, Nikki. Let me finish. I have evidence of right wing trolls who are setting themselves up as pro uh, Labour, pro Jeremy Corbyn uh, individuals on social media. I have evidence well, I of this. Well, I look forward to seeing it then. Who, well, I have evidence. So, I can so, show just, that up just, to the press. Clarify. Claiming to be Labour supporters and then using that platform to make anti-Semitic and horrible, abusive remarks. So that needs to be called out. Do, and do, what we need to sorry, do sorry, is, the what we need the to do is make sure what we need to do is make sure that Twitter to the, and Facebook going to the, to the, going to the rally are in held Square. accountable these for are taking down... These are not, nothing to do with the right. Good Lord. These people are still Labour Party criticised Tangham Debonair for going to the rally. Yeah, Faisal Islam, the presenter, is not a very experienced presenter. I'm not going to give him a pass, but I'm also not going to criticise him. He's a correspondent. He's a political editor. He's usually on the other end of the conversation, providing analysis. He's sitting there like a clown. He should be jumping in there, hammering both of them, telling them to shut up. You'll speak first. You won't interrupt. 30 seconds to you, and so on, so on, so on. But he's not very good, Faisal, because he's inexperienced. But there's, it's worth sticking with this. For going to the rally in Parliament Square. Stop Call trying to make out. party political football. Let's work together to oh, tackle anti-Semitism. Oh, please, because when have you ever wanted you to, to uh, work together on this? Well, I'm tackling anti-Semitism. I, mean, I, I think need we to should bring work in together. Uh, Emma, Emma, Emma here. Do you, think, do you think we should work together to tackle anti-Semitism? I think political parties are short. The first thing you should do should is join Ian Austin in calling out should and getting Ken Livingston expelled from the party. Should we work together to tackle anti-Semitism? Only when you're going to take it seriously. The first thing you should do is call out anybody from the Labour Party who criticised Labour MPs. It's also in a parallel universe here. Absolutely. It's your, your parallel face. universe. You're flying in the face of the uh, total evidence of a Labour Party which has a proud record of standing up to anti-Semitism. Then, then you need to expel to Ken Livingston Listen, and you need to be very clear to that the members of the Bristol member Labour, Labour Party, Party, Ian Austin, the Labour MP, stood up yesterday and called for, you, for Ken Livingston to be That's expelled. Do you support that? It's a matter for due process. Do you support process. Ken Livingston being expelled? It is a matter for due process Do you support Ken Livingston the being Labour expelled? Party. It's a matter for due process. Do you support Ken Livingston being expelled? Yeah, that's all you got, really was Williamson saying the trolls, we can prove the trolls are not actually coming from the party. And she repeated over and over again that Ken Livingston should be expelled. Now, Ken Livingston is currently still suspended from the Labour Party for 
for, I suppose, in an interview, for for uttering, for want of a better way of putting it, for speaking about a historical fact, an issue of fact, which we've talked about a lot on this programme before, about how in 1933 the Nazi party wanted the, uh, were, were, were basically working with Zionists in Germany to transfer German-born Jews to Palestine, but also to transfer their wealth, their belongings and all of that. He said he supported Zionism. He supported the ideas of Zionism at the time, which is historically accurate, even if Livingston maybe put it a bit clumsily, right? That's what was going on there. So does Williamson have absolute proof that the anti-Semitism online is coming from fake accounts designed to embarrass Labour. Yeah. She said something there, but you seem to suggest that some of this online anti-Semitic abuse mm. is a kind of false flag setup. Do you believe that that, that do you genuinely believe that that's the case? You, you say you have proof? I've, of... I've, well, yes, I have proof that there have been people who are setting themselves up fake accounts in order to try to, um, you know, denegrate uh, and undermine so, so an enemy the of Labour Jeremy Party. Corbyn sets up a fake online account well, this, I mean, pretends saying, to be an anti-Semitic This has happened, I mean, but, but clearly so there's... Not, there, I there mean, are clearly, you just downplaying No, 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 no because clearly this is an issue that we have to work together to address. There is some evidence of that happening, but clearly... You know, but by drawing attention be, to that, it, Chris Williamson, you're no, sort no, of downplaying the no, issue. No, I'm not downplaying it in exactly. any way, shape or form. We have to deal with this, but what you... It's unreasonable, it seems to me, uh, when we know that it, the, the social media sphere is, is like the Wild West. It's very unfair, I think, to, um, as it were, blame Jeremy Corbyn right. for that. Right. Now, the final bit of this is very interesting. The presenter, Faisal Islam, and the other two MPs there, the Tory MP and the DUP MP, piled in on Williamson because Williamson doesn't believe that Bashar al-Assad used chemical weapons in Syria um, last week. Have a listen. Both your colleagues raised an issue uh, off camera about, about Syria. Do you think the Syria chemical attack was well, again, a... Well, again, I think there's, again, a false characterization. Okay. characterization. Well, I, I watched what your I interview said, and no, 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 indicated well, that... What I have said, it, what it, it I have may said well have is said, I have quoted happened. people yes, like Robert Fisk, a well-respected journalist who is on the ground in Syria, who has spoken to doctors... Under, under the spoken, regime's to, kind spoken of... Spoken to survivors in the area, or people living in the area, who, who are calling into question. I've also quoted people like Lord West, the, the, the former First Sea Lord, people like General Shaw, the former commander of British Armed Forces in yeah. Iraq. These are eminent military experts so, who are calling into question the evidence and the motive. Right, so that you don't Not think me, it, you don't think, you so don't it's wrong think, to characterise okay, things. If I'm, so you think it, the this chemical thing's attack up. might not have been chemical and there might not have been an attack? Well, what has been said by uh, uh, the doctors on the ground is that, that people were, uh, uh, in his view, uh, suffering from a condition known as hypoxia, where it's right. people are shortage of oxygen, there was a dust cloud created through a military bombardment, that led to lack of oxygen. People, don't forget, are living in these subterranean... Okay. Uh, we've got about uh, 40 yeah, seconds. Quick, quick, think, quick reaction. I don't think anybody listening to that would say that you're not trying to put across an argument that this possibly did not happen. Um, what I'm and, saying and is we shouldn't have launched uh, uh, military airstrikes oh, well, that's on the strength. Yeah, that's but I think you also strength. tried to make the argument as well. You need to be clear. I think it's absolutely shocking that a member of the the British Parliament actually is calling into question what uh, people around the world have said. You only have to look at the pictures of the what? way those people... Based on what? Based on the people were suffering, based children, on children media. were dying. Sorry. Social Respected media and hearsay. Journalists reporting I have to, I have to bring this to an end. It will continue society. offline. Do return to Sky News for the real debate. It's better than PMQs in here. Yeah, a shame that, that he wasn't able to moderate that a bit better, Faisal Islam. But it was kind of shocking at the end there. Not shocking, really, but how blatant... The, the the women were, the DUP and the Conservative MP, Nicky Morgan, basically saying, how dare you not believe and how dare you call into question what other people are saying around the world. And Chris Williamson said, well, based on what? Based on what? Based on social media. Right? Because the people who claim and still claim, have claimed and still claim that the Assad government was bombing using chemical weapons, was targeting Syrian people, have offered no evidence whatsoever to support that. None. And I see pointed out there Lord West 
and of course Jonathan Shaw, the general who was dumped off of Sky News um, last week was it, the week before last week it was, last Friday dumped off Sky News for suggesting that the Assad government didn't have anything to gain because they are winning the war. It's exactly 25 minutes to the top of the hour. Going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be hearing from John Mann. And some of this stuff is quite hilarious. John Mann chairs the All-Parliamentary Committee Against Anti-Semitism or something like that. We'll hear from him in a minute. Good to be back with you. Back in two, this is the Richie Allen Show, live on richieallen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 and triggerwarning.tv. The H2O app, a powerful water structure and application that programs vibrational energies into water through the use of different sound frequencies. Once programmed, the use of water for drinking, cooking, bathing. Give it to your friends and colleagues or spread it around the garden. The list goes on. It's not just water that the app can be used for either. It's great for programming crystals too. The H2O app is free to download and is available on both Android and Apple platforms. For further information, go to h2oapp.online. Have you lost access to important data from a computer hard drive, mobile phone, or other storage device? Maybe you have a broken hard drive containing years of information, or a smartphone that no longer works from which you'd like the pictures, movies, and chats recovered. If you would like to recover data from any type of digital device, including desktop and laptop computers, external hard drives, cameras, smartphones, NAS, and RAID servers, then contact Data Clinic today at dataclinic.co.uk now. There's a place high in the mountains of Spain, a sanctuary where souls gather from all around the globe to learn about themselves and experience powerful changes in the way we see our world. They become awakened to their gifts and their power to heal others. Become part of this ever-growing worldwide family of unique, pure energy healing practitioners. Discover how amazing you truly are. Go to www www.markbayerski.com It could just change your life forever. Welcome back to the most listened to independent radio show in Europe. It's your Richie Allen Show. Want to say hi to Jen Crosby there in California. How you doing, Jen? Nice to know you're listening. It's in the midday there, isn't it? It's approaching midday on the West Coast, on the Pacific Coast. Uh, love to your mum, Shirley, as well, by the way. I hope she's well. Do tweet the programme. It's at Richie Allen Show on Twitter. Dean tweets, Assad didn't use chemical weapons. He didn't. It's as simple as that, because if he did, he would be a little bit simple. Can't be simplified any more than that for these academics, really. See what you did there, Dean. But, Dean, we can only be 99% sure that he didn't, you see. Regardless of what we know, what we don't know, what we think we know, what we believe. And I believe, like you, that he wouldn't have used chemical weapons. I believe, like you, that the situation in Syria has got nothing to do with him or his government. But at the same time, you can never be 100% sure. There is an army there, of course, as well. And I'm going to be talking about that in future programmes. Um, very interesting, the coverage of Syria. Particularly the coverage of Syria by the independent media going to talk about that on a future programme. going to find new ways to talk about these things. Uh, hi to Rich who says, uh, Richie, it boils down to a farce when people talk over one another. Where has reasonable debate gone? You can't understand either point if there's two people speaking. Yeah, it's pretty poor that. But we got enough out of it. You know, their their mantra is you can't, as an MP, you've got no right to question what your government tells you or what it is your 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 intelligence agencies tell you. So if MI6 and MI5 say that formerly the Assad government used chemical weapons and the MI5 tell you that the Russians poisoned the Skripals, you've got to believe it, Chris Williamson. To question it is treachery. This is the paradigm shift. It's not a paradigm shift. It's 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 the creation of a paradigm, is what it is. Okay, people will be terrified to speak out, to question, to contradict. 
people will be terrified. So John Mann then, I'm going to stay with this anti-Semitism just for a few minutes. This is quite interesting. It's quite funny as well. He chairs the All-Parliamentary Committee Against Anti-Semitism. He ambushed Ken Livingston at BBC Studios. You remember he ran after him, swearing and shouting and threatening him because Ken talked about the Havre Agreement, which I mentioned earlier. So John Mann was on Sky News earlier. He was on with Adam Bolton and he had some bizarre stories to tell about the harassment that he and his family have endured from, well, from the anti-Semites. I've been involved in this work for 13 years, chairing the old party committee against anti-Semitism. And uh, in the past we've had uh, Islamist death threats and a bomb squad called to, with my son in at home on his own, uh, answering the door to the bomb squad. We've had, uh, uh, we've had people prosecuted successfully, a dead bird sent through the post to my wife by a uh, self-styled Marxist, uh, uh, overt anti-Semite. Uh, and in the last few weeks, uh, threats of violence, uh, rape against my wife and daughters from a left-wing anti-Semite. And this is, um, it's disturbing. That's nothing like the abuse that Luciana Bird and uh, Ruth Smith and others have been getting, nothing like that. He's Incredibly, it's mild compared to what they've been getting. And, and this is coming, I mean, this is coming, or a lot of this is coming from within the Labour Party or Labour Party members or supporters, you're sure of that? Oh, some of that, some of the, 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 the dead bird was a Labour Party member. That's dreadful, that. That's disgraceful. It's bad enough that they're sending dead birds through the post to John Mann. But the birds are chosen because they are Labour Party supporters. So, uh, the, 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 the dead bird was a Labour Party member. <laughs> what lousy bastards! They should have killed a Tory bird, which would have made more sense, of course, if they were Labour anti-Semites. Question begs to be asked, what happened to the bird? Um, he got thrown out, and rightly so. Jesus, John, you could have buried him for Jesus' sake, eh? A Labour Party member, and you just threw him out. Man went on to say that you have a few anti-Semites in the Labour Party, not a massive amount, but you do have a wider group of apologists. So Adam Bolton, the presenter, throws in the name of the filmmaker Ken Loach, a lifelong Labour supporter, and John Mann isn't best pleased. But you see, you've had people like Ken Loach, for example, who supports Jeremy Corbyn. Apologists for anti-Semites, for racists. That's what that's Loach, what you... apologists for racists. But you see, there are... No all... place in the Labour Party for Loach. Right, so Loach is gone then. Jesus. <laughs> Who's going to be left? Surely Bolton asks him about Zionism as opposed to Jews, right? Well, he does. Is it possible to be anti-Zionist against uh, the policies of the State of Israel and not be anti-Semitic? Oh, well, I had outlined in what I said yesterday that Jewish people have the right to determine whether they're Zionists or not Zionists. No, the rest of us have got the right to self-identify for other people. But, yeah, people can be critical of governments. They can be very critical. Listen, I've spent a lot of time yeah. being critical of governments, yeah. uh, as you know, yeah. and uh, I don't pull my punches. But do you and, think that's and, the... And, and, you, and that can, of course... Do you think the, that's the problem in the left, that... that People, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, we know, is very pro-Palestinian. Uh, he's uh, anti-capitalist. Capitalism often identified with financiers who, who uh, have been identified with the, with the Jewish community. Is that where this, this is coming from, do you think? I mean, I meet with Palestinian groups, um, and rightly so, and discuss their issues with them. I meet with Palestinian groups, he said. When he said that this morning, the blue fairy keeled over on her fucking arse, dropped stone dead. OK, he doesn't meet with Palestinian groups to talk about their concerns because he couldn't give a shit about their concerns. Where was John Mann a couple of weekends ago when Israeli snipers were taking pot shots at teenagers who didn't even have stones in their hands? Where was he then? Somebody, somebody do CPR on the Blue Fairy. Unbelievable lies. He carries on. This is the, what he says next is the crux of what's really, really going on here. Use with them civilly and appropriately. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, but it's the lack of leadership. He needs to act. Now, 
he says he's going to be acting, he's his militant on anti-Semitism. All I'm saying is, do it now. And the action is what? The action is to throw out the anti-Semites, but then to change the language within the Labour Party. I said specifically to him, well, he wasn't there, but I'm sure he's now read my or heard my speech. I said, if he was to make the term Zionist as a term of abuse or insult, non-acceptable in the Labour Party, you're not going to use that because it's racist. That would change the debate overnight within the Labour Party. Uh, well, we're sure it would, John. And that's the essence of it. Do you want to hear that again, what he says there? This is the essence of it, and this is where this is all going to end up. Have a listen. If he was to make the term Zionist as a term of abuse or insult, non-acceptable in the Labour Party, you're not going to use that because it's racist. That would change the debate overnight within the Labour Party. Right. Because the agenda here is to scare people away from accusing people of being Zionist. But here's the kicker. And I've said this probably on programmes going back to 2008, 2009. If you support Israel... Not just Israel's right to exist as a country in the Middle East, but if you refuse to acknowledge its heinous human rights abuses, if you are happy for the illegal settlements to, to carry on, if you don't mind that Gaza is blockaded, the greatest open-air prison in the world, if you don't mind pregnant women dying at checkpoints in labour, if you are happy with all of that, you're a Zionist, my son. I'm channeling my inner Kipling here. You're a Zionist, my son, and that's not a nice thing to be. And I'll tell you something else that some people might think is controversial. Zionists should not be members of parliament. Zionists should not be peers, because Zionists are racist to their bone marrow. It is a supremacist, sick ideology and if somebody is exhibiting strains of it or the traits of it, they should be called out for it. They shouldn't be abused. They shouldn't be sworn at. They shouldn't be threatened. They shouldn't have dead birds sent to their houses, even if the birds are Tory party supporters. None of that bollocks. Leave them alone, but speak out about it. You're a Zionist. You're an unashamed Zionist. Pretty Patel not very pretty really, Preeti Patel, shouldn't be a member of Parliament, has no business being anywhere near Westminster. She is an unashamed Zionist stooge who, holding a front bench position, the international, what was she again? The international affairs, whatever it was, secretary, and went to Israel on her holidays, didn't tell the government, this is treachery, meeting with the government there, then coming back, has no business sitting as a member of parliament. So what they want to do, of course, is they want to criminalise using that word. You're a Zionist. That's racist. No, it isn't. You're a Zionist because you're quite happy to not only watch, but to cheerlead the brutal oppression of the most vilified the most downtrodden, the most helpless people on planet Earth. You don't give a shit about it. You take Israeli government money. You're a Zionist, my son. But they want to demonise that. They want to criminalise that. Make it illegal to say it. Well, they can try to do that. But it ain't happening. Now, the House of Lords have defeated the government on the issue of the UK staying in a customs union after Brexit. This is big news. The House of Lords voted by 348 to 225 in favour of a proposal requiring the government to report on negotiating a continued EU-UK customs union. I told you that Brexit would be dismantled, would be destroyed, it would never happen. We're seeing it being dismantled in front of our eyes. Backing this motion, the ex-EU Commissioner Lord Patton, so no conflict of interest there then, uh, he said the UK would be worse off outside a close 
customs arrangement. What a load of bollocks. The issue was debated as part of the government's EU withdrawal bill. It now goes back to the MPs. This defeat is the first of several expected as the House of Lords um, debates the government's flagship EU bill in detail. So the government is expected to be defeat, expected to be defeated on a number of very serious motions and very serious amendments to their own Brexit bill. The shadow Brexit secretary, one of Jeremy Corbyn's, I suppose, I wouldn't say he's his closest ally, but he's got one of the big jobs in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet. His name is Keir Starmer. Of course, he was understandably thrilled with the news. This is a significant step forward for all of us who are arguing that um, the UK ought to stay in a customs union with the EU. So it's a very significant um, step. It's a very significant victory, not only because of what it says, but the size um, of the uh, majority in the House of Lords. Obviously, uh, it's now got to come back to the House of Commons uh, to be considered, but it comes back with a very hefty uh, majority, which I think tells you um, a lot about the importance of this issue, which is should we be staying in a customs union with the EU? Isn't this the, the peers against the people? The will of the people? No, this is, um, as you'd expect, the usual parliamentary process. A bill will go up to the Lords, as all of them do, for amendments. If amendments are passed, and this obviously has been now, it comes back to the House of Commons for us to either approve or reject it. So ultimate power always resides with the House of Commons where we're elected. The question now is um, what happens when this vote comes back um, to the House of Commons. But this is a significant step uh, along the road for those of us that are arguing um, that it's in our economic interest for the UK to stay in a customs union with the EU. And I know that many of our US listeners won't be familiar with the House of Lords. So I'm going to help you out here. Picture Westminster. Picture the House of Commons, if you've seen it before. Lovely mahogany benches with beautiful leather. I think it's red leather in the House of Lords. I could be wrong. If you got your eyes closed, are you thinking, are you picturing this with me? Are you there with me? If you've never seen the House of Lords, you've got this big, big chamber on either side, mahogany benches, red leather, okay? At one end of the room is a big chair, and that's where the speaker will sit. Now picture wall-to-wall -wall Jabba the Hutts, lazy bastards, sitting around, snoring, farting, sleeping off the lunchtime drinking. Jabba the Hutt, wall-to-wall -wall Jabba the Hutts. That's the House of Lords, right? That's about the best description anybody could ever give of what the House of Lords is. Unelected, of course peers, unelected peers. It's as filthy a cesspool as exists on planet Earth. It is a den uh, of, uh, no, it is, a, it is a hive of scum and villainy, as the great late Obi-Wan Kenobi once said. That is the House of Lords, and that is one of the means by which Brexit will be destroyed, as you just heard there. Tucker Carlson, Fox News presenter. People are always sending me Tucker's clips I don't mind that. He's an interesting character, Tucker. He's said some interesting things on his programmes. He seems to be open-minded regarding various conspiracy theories. And he's a pretty smooth, pretty suave presenter. Look, he's working for Fox News and ultimately he's got a line that he must toe. But he does say some interesting things from time to time. He's been talking about the madness of pushing Russia to the brink of a third world war. He does a little monologue like this, but not as long or as boring or as long-winded as mine. But he does a monologue for a couple of minutes. Have a listen to Tucker. This is on the prospect of war with Russia. Well, the fantasy of Russian collusion continues to dominate American political life. It doesn't matter that almost nobody actually believes any of it and never has. Proving non-existent collusion was never the point of the exercise. The point, obviously, was blame shifting. Hillary didn't lose the election. The political establishment wasn't completely out of touch with voters. The media weren't embarrassingly wrong about everything. Nope, none of that happened. Putin did it. It's his fault. It all began as a psychological exercise, a way for a stunned ruling class to feel better about itself in the face of humiliating loss. But from there, the Russia story became a handy way to hamstring a young and honestly disorganized administration. Has Donald Trump spent a single day in office not responding to this ludicrous conspiracy theory? Probably not. 
and that was by design. You know all this by now. It's contemptible and dishonest. But the looming question is, is all of this becoming dangerous to the rest of us? Russia isn't just a CNN topic. It's not just a script on MSNBC. It's an actual country with borders and millions of people and one of the largest nuclear arsenals in the world. So you would think we would tread carefully when it really came down to it because there's no advantage in exacerbating our rivalry with Russia pointlessly. There's an obvious downside to it, war in which millions could die. And yet our leaders seem intent on driving us toward actual confrontation with the actual country of Russia. Congress, bipartisan coalition in Congress, is united for some reason behind passing more and deeper sanctions against Russia. Why? Because it's immoral not to. Shut up, they explained. In Syria, meanwhile, which is a client state of Russia, U.S. airstrikes reportedly have killed hundreds of Russians. The media are crying for more, more blood. Okay, but is this advancing any serious American interest? Not that we can see. But as long as we're picking fights with Russia, everyone in Washington can retroactively justify the mindless Mueller investigation. This is lunacy, but it could very soon get very scary. Very scary indeed. Tucker Carlson there, Fox News. Four minutes to the top of the hour. Just before we wind up this hour now. I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful that you stayed with me. Thank you for staying with me. Philip May is the husband of the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Spoken a bit about Phil, her husband, on the programme from time to time and how his interests often align with hers. Well, he works for a company that holds the most shares in BAE Systems, a big arms manufacturer. And that um, company is called Capital Group, okay? Now, he works for Capital Group. It is the largest shareholder in the arms company BAE Systems, right? And their share price has soared since the airstrikes in Syria. Now, my great friend, Mr. Ethical Nicholas Wilson, was all over this yesterday. Give Nicholas a shout out on Twitter there. Uh, love Nicholas, must get him back on the programme soon. Nicholas cottoned on to this very quickly. So did Global Research and so did RT. So this is, a, this is a, incredible. But not only that, Capital Group is also the second largest shareholder in Lockheed Martin, which is a arms manufacturing company in the good old US of A. And, would you believe it, its shares have skyrocketed since the missile strikes last week too. Huh? This hasn't gone unnoticed. I mentioned, of course, uh, Nicholas Wilson there. Many others noticing that Theresa May's husband has worked as a relationship manager for this company since 2005. But the Conservative Party's links with British Aerospace, uh, BAE I should say, um, their links go even deeper than that because George Osborne, Gideon himself, as bent as a three bob note, uh, George, uh, who now, of course, is the editor in chief of the Evening Standard, his other employer, BlackRock Investments, is the fifth largest shareholder in BAE Systems. Osborne is now editing at the Evening Standard, but of course he is an advisor to BlackRock Investment, which I told you a lot about when Carillion collapsed. Do you remember? BlackRock Investment Company that gives George Osborne nearly a million quid a year for consulting. BlackRock made a mint out of the collapse of Carillion. Do you remember that? BlackRock was short-selling shares in Carillion even while the UK government was still awarding it billion-pound contracts. It is my belief, or at least I'd like to ask the question, George Osborne, of course, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, a very recent one, was Osborne talking up Carillion and encouraging it to be awarded new contracts even though he knew the firm was worthless and at the same time was he advising BlackRock Investment to short sell the company or bet against it. It's a filthy world, dear listener. It's a filthy world. Right? Disgusting, isn't it? But it's all true. 